Good morning. Welcome to the first webinar Wednesday of 2016. Nice of you all to join us today. My name is Katie. I'm Digital Services Administrator here at uh, CABE and I'll be looking after you today and any questions and queries that you may have throughout the session. Whilst the session is underway, you can send any questions to us using the question um, panel, which is on the right hand side of your screen. You may need to expand it just to, uh, to make it visible, but you can send any um, questions through. Just type them in and they'll pop up to us. What we'll do is try and answer them either as we're going along or perhaps at the end of the session. If some questions are particularly specific to individual cases, we may come back to you separately at the end. If you're on Twitter, you can join us using the hashtag CABECPD. Today we're looking at legislation in the uh, sector, and this is the first of a series of webinars inspired by requests from members in terms of content, and today we're focusing on the Building Act. Your presenter is Kevin Blendon, he's Deputy Chief Executive here, and uh, he'll be talking you through. So just bear with me two moments, and I'll pass you over to Kevin. Good morning and thank you Katie. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, we are, as you will have noticed this morning, running without webcams, um, slight technical issue that it um, improves the, uh, the delivery because you can't actually see me and which is quite often off-putting if you're listening to one of these webinars. Um, so I'm going to start today's webinar with a couple of quick questions for you. Um, just to try and make sure that I'm pitching this to the correct audience. So the first question is really a geographical question um, about where you are located. Uh, this is really because obviously in talking about legislation, there is a variety of legislation that applies not only across the UK, but across the globe. So it's useful just to get an idea of where these things sit um, so that I'm not totally alienating part of the audience and we can try and cover as much as possible that's relevant to you. So I've got um, roughly three quarters of you have voted already on this poll. Um, it's going reasonably quickly. I'll just give it a few more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Okay, I think we've probably peaked at about there. And then hopefully, if the technology really works, you should now be able to see the results of the poll. I'm just playing with my screen to see if that's the case because it do, unfortunately what I see at this stage doesn't reflect what you see. Um, but clearly there in terms of the poll, a uh, large percentage of you within England um, and 94% of those who responded, 94-95% are within the UK and then we've got some other people watching us from overseas which is always very good. Um, so that sort of fits because we are focusing mainly on the Building Act today which is uh, applicable in England um, but obviously does apply to Wales. There is a slightly different arrangement with some of the legislation in Scotland and Northern Ireland um, so hopefully it will still be of use in terms of um, CPD really. Um, so here we go, let's try another quick question. I'm not entirely sure what's happened there and my screen's just totally changed and I don't really know why. <laughs> um, right, let's go for the another second question I was going to ask you immediately which is basically what you do. Um, again, in an attempt to try and help me to, to pitch where this goes. Um, so looking to see whether you're involved in design, surveying, building control, um, general engineering practice or something else. Again, this one won't be open as quickly because you're, you're in this run of this now so you're voting much more quickly on this one. Um, so we'll close that poll up now. Again, let you have a look at the results of that. And 70% um, of you are working in building control, 14% uh, as surveyors, five as designers, seven as engineers, and three doing something else. So a reasonable split there. Um, and we'll try and make sure, therefore, that we look at this from uh, both angles, uh, if you like, from the, the the control side in relation to legislation, but also in terms of uh, the industry having to use and work with this stuff. So, um, as I said, or as Katie said at the beginning of today, this is very much a uh, 
webinar that we've put on as a request from members, feedback that's being asked for, and to a certain extent, a level of knowledge that is expected in certain sectors of the industry. So 70% of you um, are working in building control. Actually, in the regulated side of that industry in the private sector, there is a requirement for um, competent building control professionals to have a, a general understanding of a range of legislation. So over coming months, we will be looking at a lot of, at a lot of the background legislation that, that works with our sector, Building Act, Planning Acts, Equality Act, um, Party War we've mentioned before, but some of the health and safety stuff, some of the regulatory reform stuff for fire. So this is the first of a series trying to look at some of those issues, just to give a snapshot of how some of the legislation works and interacts, and also perhaps how some of the process works in doing some of this legislation. Um, what we tend to find is the raft of legislation we have sets up acts of parliament that actually then are quite difficult to rewrite and amend and as a result the act gives us the ability to usually in most cases to write regulations which are much easier to alter and amend as time goes on but sometimes we do need significant changes to acts of parliament and that can mean that we have to go through a, a longer parliamentary process so we're going to look at the building act today and in doing that, we're going to start by looking at the sorts of things that the Building Act enables. Or, um, most of us working in the sector are probably familiar with the fact that the Building Act is the enabling legislation that sets up building regulations. Um, the current Building Act is 1984, so we're talking about a piece of legislation that is over 30 years old now. Um, but the most recent building regulations are 2010, which was the last time there was a major overhaul of the regulations, but with numerous amendments that have occurred since um, to change things almost on a yearly basis. And certainly when we see regulatory control come in under the Act, we look at regulations coming in either in April or in October each this year each year. Now we're not looking for any new building regulations this April. It may be the case that we see some minor changes in October of this year. But the other fundamental thing that the Building Act introduced back in 1984 uh, was the ability to open up building control provision and service providers to the private sector and it introduced the ability to have private building control bodies at that time the first of which was the NHBC and it was very restricted in terms of um, what they're enabled to do and the scope of, of um, the, or the number of inspectors there could be. But in reality, it's now moved on to the state where we have a, a large number of building control companies uh, offering us a range of services. Now, I'm just, I've just had one comment that says that people can't see the slides. I'm wondering if that's a general comment or it's just a one individual case. Um, I'm just going to check with Katie to see if she can see the slides. Sometimes we have issues when it goes back from polls. That yeah, we can't I can see the screen. If you could just um, see so if you can drop the PowerPoint in. Yeah, and there's a lot of people now saying they can't. So if you could just have a quick, okay. um, a quick look. I'm not, en not entirely sure what the the issue with that is, um, I'm just oh, going yeah, to go back, go back, sorry? So right, the polls just popped up. Yes, I was doing that to open and close the poll again to see if that would drop it out of it, but it doesn't seem to have, um, I, I take it you still can't see the slides? No. Right, let me, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and then um, oh. reintroduce it in a hope that that will cure the problem. Yeah. What are you seeing now, Katie? Yeah, we can, we can see your whole window now. So, yeah, as long as you keep it there with the slides, and that's fine. So, we're back to the slides now. Yeah. Thank you for bearing with us, everyone. Thank you. Okay, that's fine, and we haven't got any more polls, so that, that shouldn't happen again. I apologise for that. It is for some reason, um, although it tells me that we've gone back from the poll, it doesn't necessarily end up being the case um, in terms of where we are. Uh, just an admin thing before we proceed then, Katie, could you just tidy up the question box and take out the ones about slides and then yeah, of course. it makes it easier to monitor going forward. Okay, so 
Um, so yes, we have a situation now where we have a large number of private building control companies, and the Building Act establishes not only the uh, remit for that to happen, but also some of the processes and, and some of the regulation of that sector, and sets down provisions of how that will operate. Uh, and then the regulations themselves will determine some of the paperwork in terms of some of the notifications and what have you. The other thing that um, relating to building control that comes out of the Building Act is really about local authority charges. Now this has changed significantly since uh, the Building Act came in and it was groundbreaking legislation when the Act came out in 1984 because up until that point uh, there were no charges for building control services. Uh, it was very much supported by local authority funding, be it as it was the time, the rates, and then later council tax. Uh, it was only 1984 that introduced the provision of char charging, and it was very prescriptive in terms of the charging regime for the local authority, but there was no control on what happened in the private sector in terms of how charges were, were met. The last set of changes for authority charges and fees for local authorities has enabled it to be much more related to the cost of delivering the work um, and therefore there's more ability to have a, a, set, a scale of fees that reflect what's involved. But the major difference, if you like, between the private sector and the public sector is obviously the, the public sector has to cover costs um, but doesn't necessarily have to do any more than that. And then there are a lot of other bits and pieces within the Building Act which are not just building regulations. Um, there are additional duties in there placed upon local authorities. There are um, abilities within there for um, those enforcing legislation to enter premises. And not all parts of the Building Act have been enabled. There are provisions in there for a lot of things that we don't see in regulations as yet. And we also have a lot of provisions in there that originally needed to be considered in their own right, but which have subsequently been superseded for um, parts of the reg building regulations themselves, so not as effective as they originally were. Now, when somebody originally drafted the Building Act, they were quite far-reaching in terms of what they anticipated would have to be covered within the scope of legislation in the future. So, for instance, when the Building Act was drafted in 1984, it included provision for regulation to deal with water efficiency and conservation of water which wasn't actually introduced into regulations until a couple of years ago. So in reality, somebody had at that stage at least looked forward and decided that we needed um, provision uh, at some time in the future to address these issues. But there are other things that within the build, Building Act that, that aren't covered or weren't covered originally. And to a certain extent, uh, the government have used introduction of other pieces of legislation to affect some of these issues and to amend the provisions of the Building Act. And this started really in 2004 with the Secure and Sustainable Building Act, which was a private member's bill, which basically means it's a, a bill driven forward by a member of parliament when their name is drawn out of a, a lottery um, to include provisions that they would like to see. And that particular bill that became an act in 2004 amended the Building Act in terms of the scope of what it could apply to, um, but also changed the political focus at the time as well. Some of the other acts have affected work under the Building Act, things like the Climate Change and Sustainable Energy Act, that really has had an impact on things like our enforcement processes, and the Housing and Regeneration Act in the same vein has affected some of the formal process about the legal uh, action when building regulations aren't complied for. And then most recently, um, last year, we saw the Deregulation Act, which came in just on the cusp of the end of the, the previous um, parliament and amended a whole load of things across all walks of life to remove legislation that either wasn't applicable anymore or was duplicating something that was somewhere else. And one of the instances, one small part of what is a very large act, related to building regulations in that it enabled the Building Act to include within regulation optional standards that would be determined by planning consent. And we saw those introduced last year in October 
that now affect how regulations will look going forward. Um, so to look at some of those in a little bit more detail, the original Building Act very much was about securing the health and safety and welfare of people in or about buildings. Um, it did include the phrase convenience, which to a certain extent allowed us to look at things like access for people with differing needs. Um, but in addition to that, which was primarily about health and safety, we also had provision to set standards in relation to conservation of fuel and power and preventing waste of water, as I've mentioned. The Sustainable and Secure Building Act introduced additional provisions in relation to protection or enhancement of the environment, to facilitate sustainable development, and to further prevention and detection of crime. Now, not all of these elements are, are fully within the regulatory framework. But certainly now, we, we, we saw last year with the introduction of Part Q to the building regulations, that we have a situation where that interaction between different legislation has enabled us to go to a wider extreme. Many of you may recently have seen a government consultation on a proposed Part R of the regulations, which deals with minimum levels of infrastructure within the property in relation to connectivity. Uh, broadband internet connections. It is um, possible that we may need to see further changes to the base legislation to enable that because it's difficult to see that it sits within the current scope of the range of building regulations. A um, couple of those other bits and pieces then, the uh, Climate Change and Sustainable Energy Act uh, really affected prosecution times. Um, time limits for prosecution uh, set by the Magistrates Court Act and for offences under the building regulations, there previously were fairly tight time limits in terms of getting these things in front of a court if the builder was going to be prosecuted for non-compliance. And in 2006, the Climate Change and Sustainable Energy Act amended that time limit to give a longer period um, at that stage initially just in terms of anything related to conservation and fuel and power so really part L um, and that was because it was considered that a lot of the issues around non-compliance when something's done wrong during the construction process take a longer period to actually become evident that there's a problem with the um, building and therefore we needed longer to actually be able to deal with it and enforce these things. But obviously it didn't make a lot of sense for some of the legislation to be dealt with under one process and one some under another. So the Housing and Regeneration Act in 2008 broadened that restriction that was just on Part L related matters to any offence and therefore we have the current regime that we're operating under where we have a two year time limit for prosecution. Right, I'm just going to have a quick look through and see if we've got any uh, particular questions. Has anything come through as yet, Katie, as far as you're aware? Hello, there's just the one sitting there if you want to address that from Stuart at all. Um, I th that's the one about uh, provision for approved inspectors in Scotland and Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Um, as far as we're concerned, obviously, whenever our view as an association has to reflect that of the members um, and it is a very tricky one for the association. A few years ago, uh, Scotland actually did hold a consultation on whether to open up to private sector building control. As far as the membership of building regulation, uh, of CABE is concerned, obviously we have members practicing in private sector and public sector building control, as well as a lot of members dealing with the design and the construction process. And we have to present a balanced view. I think we are broadly in favour of any system of building control that improves standards, possibly by opening up to competition, but it is as absolutely fundamental that uh, we maintain the quality and the standard of the built project and that we also, in whatever regime we work on, has a situation where there's no ability for conflict of interest and any compromise of professional ethics. 
And for that reason, we currently work with the, the CIC AIR, the registration body in the UK for private sector building control, and we are working to help them in relation to their code of conduct for building control. And we've also recently worked on a um, pan-industry group that's been looking at issues of conflicts of interest and ethics. So broadly, we will always do whatever our members ask us to do, but we support any initiative that will improve customer service and raise standards, really. I appreciate that's not a definitive answer, but that's because when speaking for a range of members, it's very difficult to give a definitive answer. Right, a couple of questions that have come in around the, the, the issues I've just been talking about in terms of prosecution. Um, do we have a, a two-year time period for prosecution? Yes, it is a two-year time period from the date on which the contraventions occurred or the date on which we become aware of that. It does give us longer to get it through the courts. The actual prosecution play, process is purely local authority. Um, so approved inspectors achieve compliance by negotiation, um, by persuasion, but if all else fails, it reverts back to the local authority for the formal court process. Um, and it does just give us longer when we get to the situation that work is finished and we may not readily be aware of a contravention that may have occurred, particularly if it's something in relation to energy in terms of the performance of the building or indeed other more um, traditional building regulation matters like maybe damp penetration. Um, so in reality, we have a longer period to get things in front of the court. Um, that seems to have picked up, I think, possibly two or three questions there. Um, there is a question, do we have numbers of any prosecutions under the Act in England and Wales? I haven't got precise numbers. All I can say is it is very, very few. Um, most building regulation compliance is achieved by building control by providers by negotiation. Resorting to the courts is a, a last uh, resort. And in addition, um, obviously the court process for pure prosecution is primarily against the developer, and prosecution doesn't necessarily get the work resolved and put right. More normal is to serve an enforcement notice against the owner to force the work to be put right. And that tends to mean that that gets done more often. Uh, in addition, there is an issue in that all of this, in terms of prosecution, is a local authority-based matter. It has to go through the normal no local authority processes, and the, the first instance in terms of local authority enforcement from a legal point of view is all enforcement across all services they provide has to be considered as, as to whether or not it's in the public interest. And quite often, if there's an issue just with an individual property and non-compliance, it may be more appropriate to serve an enforcement notice than the prosecute because the prosecution might not be in the public interest. And there is just one question there in terms of when is the two-year period running from? Is it from the offence or when the offence occurred? Um, there is case law, albeit going back some while, that will more or less support either case here. But the general he held, uh, opinion has to be that it's um, from when we're aware of the contravention. Um, and it is possible, obviously, that this then has a knock-on effect. And this is what led to the changing of the wording on completion certificates and final notices that basically said they are evidence but not conclusive evidence of um, compliance with the building regs. There are a couple of other bits and pieces coming in in terms of questions, but I will try and pick those up later on in the presentation. Um, so to move on, what did the Deregulation Act do? Well, as I say, this came in last year. It's a huge piece of legislation, um, probably bedtime reading for several months uh, on the, on almost on the equivalent of war and peace, I should think. But as far as building regulations and the Building Act is concerned, it's really forging this link between planning, um, requiring a level of compliance with building regulations as a condition of a planning approval, and giving a range of options that can therefore be seen. Um, so, for instance, Part M and the three different levels of compliance we have for access to dwellings. So those have, if you like, amended and altered the way that the, the Act and the regulations made under it apply. Um, what we've then got 
so as far as the, the Act is concerned is, as I say, building regulations, and that sets down the regime for application, enforcement, appeals of decisions, and who's going to supervise the work. Um, but we also have other bits that sit within the Building Act, um, abilities for local authorities to deal with defective and dangerous structures um, from dilapidated premises, which may be dealt with by perhaps a planning authority, through to a dangerous structure, which might be a building control issue. Um, separate legislation, separate powers to protect the interests of the public, to carry out work in lieu of um, owners complying with notices and to recoup costs as necessary. The Building Act also sets down some procedural um, requirements in terms of demolitions, in terms of notifications, but at the same time demolitions is perhaps also covered by planning permissions as well. And there were some other certain linked powers, as they were termed, within the Building Act that said not only when you're considering a new development do you have to comply with building regulations, but there are some other basic things that you have to do. And those linked powers that were set in 1984 related to provision of drainage, refuse collection, making sure there were sufficient exits, supply of water, making sure there was a WC or a bath on the premises, and food storage. And pretty much all of those now have been absorbed into building regulations. So as far as the building regulations are concerned, um, they're made under the Building Act. They establish minimum standards of performance. They tend to be set in functional and performance standard ways. Now this, it was a change in 1984 when the Building Act was introduced. Um, prior to that, regulations tended to be very specific. So for instance, a regulation for energy may well have said the U value of an external wall shall not exceed 0.6. Since 1984, we've moved over to functional and performance standards, so more focused on the aim of what the legislation is trying to achieve. So we see a lot more wording saying reasonable provision shall be made for. And that has made, to a certain extent, interpretation and enforcement of the regulations somewhat more difficult uh, in terms of compliance. If the, bill, if the regulation simply says the building shall adequately resist the passage of moisture to the inside, um, there is an issue in terms of enforcement in that if somebody were to build a property without a damp proof course and a damp proof membrane, theoretically, although that doesn't meet best practice or any of the acknowledged guidance, if the building doesn't actually leak and no water penetrates to the inside, there is a doubt as to whether the regulations have been contravened. And that then, if you like, refers, gets us back to this time period for a contravention. What we have seen over the last five years or so, though, is a mix now of some very general regulations and then some very specific regulations being introduced alongside those. So we have a very general regulation about water efficiency that talks about undue water consumption and reasonable provision. And then alongside that, we have very specific regulation that talks about and actually stipulates how many litres of water per person per day can be used. So as a result, it does get uh, a bit of a mix because we've now got some reasonable provision, which allow the designer a reasonable scale of flexibility in how they comply, but then some very specific regulations alongside that. The scope of the regulations themselves, as I said before, it's about health and safety, energy conservation, water efficiency, security, access and convenience. And the way we would deal with that is then that the Building Act gives us the power to produce approved documents as guidance. Now, the approved document has a specific legal status. Uh, if the guidance in the approved document is followed completely, then it is considered that the scheme has complied with the legislation. But designers have the option to comply by any other means. So the approved document is purely guidance. People do not have to follow it. Um, and that does give us a reasonable amount of scope. Now, if we look at what else is there in terms of regulation, and perhaps in terms of um, approved inspectors and the building control process, 
we have a range of delivery models in terms of building control. We have local authorities who can deal with building control within their um, administrative boundaries. Now, a lot of local authorities have combined in terms of building control and building regulation provision to share resources and take advantage of that. Um, they also will work in partnership so that key clients can deal with one local authority for all of the design and then a different local authority geographically depending on when the work is occurring. Approved inspectors can operate throughout England and Wales and I appreciate the graphic there hasn't got Wales on it. Um, that's purely because of uh, another slight technicality that we're seeing to creep in now where local authorities can set up companies to operate as approved inspectors in areas outside of their own borough boundary and that's not quite the same situation in Wales as of yet. So we have quite a different variety of models and a large number of building control bodies providing those solutions. And then when I was going to come back to some of the issues that have been raised around enforcement and compliance was to look at how it tends to work in terms of a process uh, in relating to building regulations. A, an application can be dealt with by a local authority or an approved inspector. If the local authority are dealing with the application, they check applications, they check plans, they inspect work, and most of our compliance is achieved by negotiation, but there is at the end of the job the possibility of prosecuting the builder or serving an enforcement notice against the owner. If an approved inspector is dealing with the project, once they have issued their initial notice to advise local authority that they are dealing with the particular project, the local authority's legal powers under the Building Act in terms of Section 35 and Section 36, which allow prosecution and enforcement, are suspended whilst that initial notice is in effect. In other words, whilst the approved inspector is dealing with the work. Um, now again, the approved inspector will be looking to negotiate a compliance solution, but ultimately, if it doesn't comply, the job then has to revert back to the local authority. At that stage, the initial notice is cancelled and the local authority get back their powers for prosecution and enforcement. So trying to pick up on some of the more recent questions that cover some of that, um, is it possible to prosecute after a completion certificate has been issued? The answer to that question is yes. Um, that's why the wording on the certificate is, is evidence but not conclusive evidence. In carrying out a prosecution, um, obviously one of the things that the court will consider is whether or not the local authority would have been aware of the contravention before the notice was served. Uh, but it is a very important point because um, the status of completion certificates is such that they are not really worth the paper they're all written on, but unfortunately the courts don't necessarily appreciate this. I had a case recently where um, a completion of certificate had been issued and it then became apparent there was a fault with the building in terms of moisture penetration. Um, the owner obviously did you know, what he thought was the right thing and took the builder to court to get it put right. Um, unfortunately, the builder stood up in the court and waived the completion certificate and said, no, everything must be okay because it's signed off by building control. And the court, to be honest, somewhat incorrectly concluded that was the case and dismissed it. Um, and that isn't the situation. Things aren't necessarily correct just because there is a completion certificate or a final certificate. And uh, enforcement can still take place afterwards. There's a procedural issue here about what's the difference between a notice of contravention and an extension of time under the approved inspector regulations. Because approved inspectors cannot deal with formal legal prosecutions or enforcements, the process is that once the negotiation starts to fail in terms of cajoling somebody to comply, then yes, an approved inspector will look at drafting out a notice of contravention to explain what is wrong and to advise that the job may have to revert to the local authority to um, enforce it. The extension of time is because uh, approved inspectors have a limited time period in which to issue a final certificate on a job 
once the job has been completed or occupied. And if this can't be done within that time scale, then the approved inspector can ask the local authority to extend that. Uh, they would normally only do so if there were light at the end of the tunnel and they could see that it was going to get to compliance. But the, approved, the local authority, unless there's good reason not to, would agree to that extension of time to give the approved inspector longer to resolve the matter. Okay. Um, Okay, there are a couple of um, questions about uh, or asking for opinion and I'll try and deal with those at the end. Somebody's also said that in this box actually, um, although that arrow links from the uh, negotiation box on the approved inspector to the prosecute builder, it doesn't necessarily mean the local authority are going to prosecute. They may get to a compliance situation without prosecuting. Um, I think it is also fair at this stage to point out that there are some anomalies. Not all building regulations are actually enforceable under Section 35 and 36 of the building regulations. And it can lead to difficulties at the end of the project. So for instance, um, if somebody fails to submit uh, a water efficiency calculation, I believe that's one of the correct ones, um, it's not actually enforceable. Um, the approved inspector can't sign the job off because it doesn't comply, but in reverting it, there is no legal action. So yes, even once the negotiation phase has failed, the local authorities still have their range of options available. But it is true to say that the purpose of reversion is to enable the local authority to uh, um, sort the issue out and get it to a compliance situation by whatever means. Uh, somebody's just asked what's the rationale behind a time limit for approved inspectors to deal with the job. It is purely because um, local authorities may have to take legal action and if there were no time limit on the approved inspector reverting the job back to the local authority, then there would be the potential that the local authority would run out of time to deal with an issue because of the amount of time it had taken to be resolved or reverted back. So it is fair to say that there needs to be some time limit. It is debatable as to whether those time limits should be reviewed in view of the fact that prosecution time limits have changed. But the situation we have is where it sits at present. Right, um, to, to move on ever so slightly to look at some of the other things that are under the Building Act in terms of fees and charges. Approved inspectors um, can set any fee that they wish in relation to um, a project, they will normally do this based upon the level of service they're going to provide, the number of inspections they're going to make. Uh, that obviously has to be based upon what they feel is suitable to ensure compliance, not just on what the, con the client can afford, um, but it does enable quite a bit of, of ability to set whatever fee is reasonable. And obviously as a private company, approved inspectors will probably be looking to achieve a profit year on year. Local authorities can set charges for individual parts of the service, so for plan assessment, site inspection, building notices, regularizations, which are work that's already been carried out, which actually only the local authority can deal with, and reversion, which is when these jobs go back to the local authority from an approved inspector. Um, there's much more freedom now in terms of how local authorities set those charges for individual jobs and to a large extent they will be risk assessing what needs to be inspected and who's involved with the property. Uh, the ultimate aim of a local authority is to achieve a cost neutral surface and reinvest any surplus that's made back into the building control process. Right, a couple of other questions. Do CABE have any figures relating to the number of reversions, um, no is the answer, um, but logically speaking, if, you, if we look at the relatively low number of enforcement cases across the UK, the number of reversions is relatively low, um, and I think that's because a common sense approach is being taken to these things, that even if approved inspectors get to the stage where they may have to revert it, the two bodies then working together can usually get things to a compliance situation. 
and then can local authorities archiving projects when approved inspectors must issue a final notice. Yet there is a, a slight um, discrepancy across the industry whereas approved inspectors have to issue a final certificate within a given time frame or agree an extension of time whereas potentially local authorities could just leave the file open on the shelf and um, that is something that's being looked at going forward but to be honest it's good practice for everybody to be signing off jobs and to a large extent uh, the the client awareness and the legal profession and finance institutions have at least now begun to recognize that they should be seeing completion certificates before properties are sold or before um, finance is released so actually the provision and issuing of a final certificate or a completion certificate can be a driver for moving forward and obviously although approved inspectors can end up in difficulty um, if they can't actually get to a, a compliance situation they do have the ability to um, conclude that you know they won't work with a particular client again and quite often that client relationship can be enough to get the, um, the works put back into a compliant situation. Um, quick question, is contravention the only reversion process? Uh, clearly contravention would revert back to local authority. There are other instances where for one reason or another an approved inspector can, has to cease dealing with the work, you know, they go out of business or they're no longer capable of doing it and at that stage the, the project may revert back to local authority or it may transfer to uh, another approved inspector. So the reversion is basically that point where an application is no longer dealt with under the initial notice that was submitted and as a result the initial notice is cancelled and the work goes back to um, the local authority. Somebody's now asked if we can clarify if mandatory inspection is required. The Building Act and building regulations used to set a um, number of statutory stages when developers had to notify local authorities that the work was ready for inspection. Um, the problem with the statutory notification stages is they were quite historic, so it tended to focus on where the risk of non-compliance was maybe three, four decades ago, so most of it was below ground in terms of foundations, drainage, oversight, and then completion. Um, that framework has gone we still need notification of commencement and completion but the current guidance that's out there basically says that the minimum number of inspections on any one project is one and that the level of inspection should relate to the risk of contravention so whether it's local authority or approved inspector setting up a uh, service level agreement or a, a service plan for a particular project they should be considering what's likely to go wrong and inspecting at those stages and obviously setting the fee to cover the cost of doing that. Okay, um, I think I've picked up on most of the questions that we've gone. Are there anything else that you've seen there, Katie? Uh, there was just a couple which I flagged up in bed for you, the ones that you were saying was the opinion based. I didn't know if you were in a position to address those now. Okay, yeah, I will try and address those now. I must admit, the uh, uh, as with this technology, sometimes it's great, sometimes it isn't. So the I haven't got flagged up in red, ah. but still, um, it's all right. I'll scroll back through and see uh, where we are. Right, um, there was one there about how do we get consistency in planning and design? How is it delivered? Um, so to be fair, one of one of the issues is that that because the regulations are performance-based regulations, the terminology is very much reasonable or suitable or adequate. There is a wide scope for interpretation and application of those standards. From the building control side, as far as possible, we try to identify issues and provide joint industry guidance. So the, the sector in building control is represented by a couple of bodies, um, LABC for local authorities, in England and Wales, um, and ACAI, which is the, the body for uh, approved inspectors, although not all approved inspectors are members of ACAI. Um, those two bodies together issue technical advice, but more importantly, together and combined with the three professional bodies that represent the sector, uh, 
um, ourselves, RICS and CIOB. We form the Building Control Alliance and the Building Control Alliance produces technical guidance for designers and for building control professionals to try and aid in a common level of interpretation. But there will always be differences and this is why to a large extent um, people look for a provider who can provide them with a consistent approach. It is an absolute fundamental principle of building control that um, whether it's a private sector company or a local authority um, looking to get a project, that competition may well be on service delivery or cost. Um, it should not be around interpretation or application of the legislation. Okay, um, looking up in terms of where else are we on? Kevin, you've got a question um, from Karen about the other regulations which aren't enforceable other than the water efficiency which you've already discussed. Yes. Um, yes, there are a number of, of regulations which aren't actually enforceable and a lot of them relate to uh, the provision of information or some of the certification bits of paper that we'd see at the end of the pr uh, project. So some of the, the information in, reg in guidance or in regulation where it suggests that we need to think, see things like information being passed to the end user. Um, things like commissioning certificates being provided, evidence that an EPC is in place. A lot of these things aren't necessarily enforceable and it does need to track back and try and see with the base legislation whether it is something that's covered by the regulations. What I will try and do is when we post this, um, this seminar online, um, the link from our website, we'll try and post somewhere there a short summary of the, the particular legislation that isn't enforceable under section 35 and 36, if that will help. Okay. Now, I know there was something else about what's our opinion, but I just can't actually find it at the moment. Um, so just a couple of questions that have come in down the... Um, slightly more recently, when approved inspectors are appointed, who monitors their competence or qualification to ensure they undertake their roles correctly? Approved inspectors are um, have to be registered and in effect licensed by a, an organisation called CICAIR, Construction Industry Council Approved Inspectors Register. Um, that's a five year licensing arrangement, there are rigid standards that have to be met to become registered and to maintain that and that process includes revisiting and auditing those building control bodies. So there is a level of competence and qualification, not only of those running the company but those actually delivering the building control service that's required within that framework. A um, couple of other things there. Kevin, Quickly, what's happened to it? Yeah. Sorry, before you move on, just uh, saying there's a couple of quick questions um, on that subject, but about um, where is the same sort of for the local authorities in terms of their competencies? Who checks that? Um, at present, uh, there isn't the same level of check for local authority in terms of, uh, if you like, checking competence or qualifications. Um, to be, we have a, a system in the UK that has existed for quite a long while where building control providers tend to look for uh, staff with one of two or three professional qualifications um, and by asking for that they are then relying to a certain extent on the professional body's views of competence. Now at CAVE we have a membership framework that is driven by key competencies that are benchmarked at the highest level in the industry. Um, so our members have a level of competence. But as with everything, that's only relevant whilst people undertake continuing professional development to maintain that level. Employers have to make their own mind up. There is a lot of work being done at the moment and certainly we are suggesting as a professional body that if there is a regulatory system that requires certain standards of conduct, certain levels of competence for the private sector, that should equally extend to local authorities. And to be fair, LABC are very much of the same opinion that local authorities provide a, a competent, qualified service. So there is a, a recognition in the industry. What there isn't, if you like, is the same framework. Uh, 
in the public sector as there is in the private sector. And do, 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 do. Okay. A couple of other things we need then. Um, <laughs> I think that's that's just a question there. Could could I mention um, building control performance standards? There are a set of standards set by a group called BCP SAG, which is the Building Control Performance Standards Advisory Group, um, for the industry, which set levels of performance, uh, levels of CPD, level of of, of qualification, um, which are um, may ask for an annual return from all building control bodies to uh, complete that to establish uh, that we are maintaining a level across the industry. Now, we went through a period where the level of returns did dip off. It has been improving. The standards have been updated to be more relevant. And yes, this is one way in which we can judge the relative performance of building control bodies. And they that body does produce each year uh, results of those surveys to establish what's actually happening. It obviously deals with some issues like volumes of work as well. But there is a framework there to set standards and those are constantly being reviewed to see if we've got the right uh, situation to go. Okay, I think there's one there to say, has the CIC ever revoked a license? Um, I can't really comment on that in too much detail. No, as far as I'm aware, there's no one actually had a license revoked, but there has been a range of, of disciplinary action taken and measures put in place to improve performance and that's there but there is the ability to remove the license should somebody not be operating correctly okay and then um, other bits and pieces I think there's a lot of issues about is the system work fair from one side or the other um, are there differences? Are those fair? I've got to be honest, at this point, I have to separate my own personal views from those of the association. As I said earlier on, when we're, when we're trying to look at the views of the association, we have to take on board that we do have people operating on both sides of the fence. So we have to ensure that we prevent a balanced view that's for the good and centered on the interests of the public. And that's what we attempt to do. I think it's in everybody's interest to ensure that no matter where the building control service comes from, it's of a very high standard. Um, and I think that's really as much as we can say at this stage. Okay. Um, so, in reality, I think that's covered off. There are a lot of other questions. And what I will do is maybe try and post some frequently asked questions in this one on our website as well to try and put a little bit of meat on the bones of some of the things I've discussed as we've gone through this morning, um, because there is quite a lot there that perhaps I need to look at in a relative uh, bit of detail. And obviously, I can go into more uh, detail about some of the case law in terms of time limits of prosecutions and things of that sort. OK, so I will try and um, obviously deal with some of those issues on our frequently asked questions when we post this online. Fine, in which case at this stage, I think I'm going to hand back to Katie to wrap up. OK, thank you very much. Thank you for your time this morning, Kevin. Um, I think everyone will agree that was a really interesting session, actually, in terms of the engagement from everybody. We've had loads of questions coming in, as Kevin has just said. Um, and again, we will sit and work this morning on, on getting responses um, online to the majority of the questions. So thank you. Um, you can next find us online on the 24th of February, and Kevin is going to be discussing the issues of water efficiency. Uh, information will be available on our website to register if you haven't done so already, but it would be good to see you online. So again, that's it from us today, and uh, thank you very much. Like I say, if you want, need to catch up with this webinar, we're going to pop it onto our YouTube channel, hopefully later on today, so you can share it around with your colleagues. Don't forget, you can record an hour's CPD on, the, on, our, on, our, on your record on our website, that's what I meant. And again, anybody who does catch up afterwards, the CPD, the entitlement's still there. So thank you for joining, have a good rest of the day, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>